Hey there kiddos! I'm continuing my battle series today with the next Chain of Dogs battle which is at Geller Ridge. Uh, it's personally my favorite battle, uh, maybe within the entire series, uh, mostly because of how visually striking it is to me. Once again, Coltane is outnumbered and the enemy has had time to prepare. Not only is the battle location forced upon him, but the very terrain itself has been altered by Camist Relo in order to create one giant trap that it seems like Coltane will not be able to get out of. Before we get into that, however, a few things have happened since the Battle of Sakala Crossing, and knowing them will give a little bit more context to the upcoming battle. Most importantly, uh, through the interrogation of a Tathansi tribesman, it is learned that Uberid is fallen and there will be no safe shelter or hope for relief for the Malazans there. Coltane also knows that Admiral Nock will not be allowed to sail out from Eren in order to assist the Seventh. So there's no point in trying to recapture the city of Uberid because it will just be a trap, basically. They'll be stuck there and then get surrounded with no hope of relief. It's going to be a bad time. So, the Seventh's only hope now is to continue on towards Eren, which seems like an impossibly far task, since it will take many more months and have to cross many hundreds more leagues of hostile territory. This whole information is incredibly demoralizing, and most people kind of just assume that they aren't going to make it, but they're just going to be struggling against their fate. And, I mean, after all, when death is inevitable, all you really have left is the struggle, so why not struggle as long as you can? The other big issue is the attempt to kill uh, the Tythansi war leader has failed. Though, we did discover that he was being possessed by one of the spirits that received some of the power from the Semp God and got kind of corrupted, so... Now that the spirits and the warlocks are aware of the situation, they can kind of make their own trap and the spirits will be able to attack and consume that leftover uh, segment of power. While I was looking for supplemental material on Geller Ridge, I found a pretty cool forum called Cartographer's Guild. Uh, it's just a place for people who really love maps and enjoy making them so if you like kind of historical fantasy even modern maps just made in a various amount of styles it's actually pretty cool and maybe if you want to get into map making it seems like it'd be a really good spot to actually learn about cartography on this forum i actually found a post by a user m bartles m where they described their desire to actually create a map for the battle of geller ridge uh, this is the sketch that they end up showing and what they, what they used for the, what they were actually thinking of. Uh, honestly, I really like it. It's pretty cool. It shows the basin. It's got all the, all the bits. But then they were going to actually be making it a different style. And unfortunately, the last updated post where they show their progress was in 2018. So unfortunately, it's not finished. And I don't think we'll ever see the finished product, but it looks really cool. And it definitely influenced how I was actually imagining the map in my head. So for my map, I made it more of a terrain style, obviously. Uh, but I've got the full basin here. And Coltane is still traveling from the east and trying to go to the west over here. Uh, and it crosses through the river Patha, uh, is going through the basin. It's very, very shallow. So this isn't going to be contested crossing of the river because there's essentially not going to be any way that it would affect the battle. Uh, it's, only, it's only really a few inches short, pretty narrow, not going to be an issue for the troops crossing. So what Camist Relo instead has decided to do, he has decided to change the entire western edge of the basin to form one large trap. Honestly, this is really Camist Relo being competent for the first time. It's kind of a miracle, I know, but uh, the trap is very intense and would probably work against anybody, quite frankly. Since he had plenty of time to prepare, he had his engineers basically carve away the western half of the basin. This whole side used to be a slow uh, rise and eventually get up to the same level that Geller Ridge is on. However, he carved away the hillside in order to make just a single ramp. So they built up this ramp with the extra dirt and debris that they carved away from the side. Uh, so essentially there's this big cliff here now 
uh, along Geller's Ridge, that then there's only this one ramp leading up to exit the basin. This trap ends up being a few different pieces really working together pretty well. Uh, Camus Relo's idea is to, first of all, the make the ramp out of loose dirt. So it's not packed. Uh, it's going to be very, very hard for horses and soldiers to have traction because of how steep the hill is. So it's going to be loose, going to be a little tricky. And in addition, because it is loose dirt, as soldiers start dying from either arrow fire or what have you, uh, blood, piss, everything like that from people dying is going to be mixing in with the dirt, making mud, making the hillside even more slick, making it difficult for Coltane's forces to actually really defend against anything. So, his plan is to allow Coltane to march his forces up this ramp, and then at the top he has his elite troops. They're going to be basically a brick wall, heavy infantry, going to be a brick wall at the top of the hill, not allow Coltane to progress any farther. He has other archers up at the top as well, who will be able to... Uh, I can't really draw it very well, but this ramp continues on. So there's, these sides here are actually overlooking the ramp a little bit. So archers are going to be able to be on both sides and have just a beautiful enfilade to be able to just shoot at wide open targets on the ramp. So there's going to be a heavy heavy wall at the top holding in Coltane. Going to be archers on the sides shooting and whittling down his numbers. And then there are also two large forces, both in the northern basin and the southern basin, who are going to be able to then encircle and entrap Coltane and all of the refugees, anybody who's going to be there. Quite frankly, it, it's a beautifully done trap, considering that Coltane has to go this way. And with that, that really is the description of the map, with the exception of this little monastery fort down here that overlooks the basin. It doesn't have any effect on the battle, it just kind of is a, a little feature that gets mentioned that I thought would be kind of cute to include. So, with all that out of the way, let's get into the actual troop placements for both sides. Both of the Whirlwind armies that participated in the Battle of Sakala Crossing have joined together, making one massive force. Camistrilo was still in overall command, and in preparation for the battle, he has split his army into three separate forces. Each of these forces outnumbers the entirety of the Malzahn 7th and the Wiccans. The reason for splitting his forces is due to the trap I discussed earlier, so now let's see how they're actually taking the field. On top of Geller Ridge are the Elite Heavy Infantry, which is a mixture of the Garan Heavies, Camus Relos Heavies, and the Semk Warriors. Additionally, there are at least two companies of Keneld Archers to flank, as well as Camus Relos Command Post. The two groups in the basin are split by the path that Coltane will take, one to the north and one to the south. They are spread out to allow for flanking and encircling movements. In the north of the basin, there are three legions of Ubari infantry along with Sialk and Tapasi cavalry. In the south of the basin, west to east, are ranks of Tithansi archers supported by Debral cavalry. Legions of Halifant infantry with a company of Sialk heavies followed by more archers and cavalry. The last hidden element of the Whirlwind Army is a force of about 20,000 Tithansi Lancers led by the troublesome Tithansi Warleader. They are not upon the field of battle yet, and the plan is to have them attack from behind, taking out refugees and the supply train, or whatever havoc they can wreak. For this battle, the Malazan forces are going to be split. Coltane can't afford to be slowed down by the herds or refugees for the upcoming battle, so they are left behind before entering the lake bed and are guarded by the Weasel Clan warriors, which are numbering between 4 and 5,000. The 7th Army itself is arrayed like a spear and made up of several distinct parts. The vanguard, or spear point, is composed of the Malzahn marines in the center and Crow Clan warriors to either side to make the spear barbs. Behind them are around 5,000 foolish dog warriors wearing their archaic armor, effectively making them heavy cavalry. Behind the horse warriors are the wounded soldiers, who are entirely surrounded by the rest of the 7th army, mostly the medium infantry. 
In the evening before the battle, Coltane has come up with a pretty sound plan. With a trap like this, there's really only two options, either back off to avoid the trap, or hit hard and try to turn the trap against the enemy. Nine out of ten times, you want to avoid the trap. The losses coming from trying to attack fortified positions will usually be mind-numbingly huge. Unfortunately, Coltane can't afford to go anywhere else, so he will be ramming his army down Camus Relo's throat. This is a high-risk, high-reward move. The battle begins with the eerie imagery of the assembled whirlwind forces raising an uproar, slamming swords against shields, and in answer, the seventh just marches silently onward without any faltering. The imagery that Duker evokes is chilling, letting us feel the violence and tragedy about to be unleashed. Personally, I just find it to be such badass imagery of this army being completely outnumbered and seemingly marching to their deaths, but not really having any hesitancy or anything like that. They just keep marching. And, ooh, just nice and chilling. As the 7th continues their steady march, tribal horse warriors ride along the enemy lines, keeping everyone held in position. Archers move into position at the top of the ramp, and there seems to be disbelief holding back the first wave. Coltane did not falter. His troops continued right into the enemy's trap, facing three separate forces that each outnumbered the seventh alone. This calm couldn't last, however, and as the seventh finally reaches the ramp, the archers let loose their storm of arrows. The seventh spear points continued up the ramp, weathering the arrows. After the first wave, the archers moved to the banks, lining the upper portion of the ramp, to allow a deadly enfilade from both sides once the marines engaged the heavy infantry. At a signal, the flanking crow warriors surge out and forward, striking at the archers with bows of their own. Bodies fall down the banks, and the archers scatter. The crow pull back out of the space between the two forces to post on the flanks again. As the marine wedge finally makes contact with the Semp and Garan heavies, the jaws of the whirlwind trap finally begin to close. At the same time, however, the Tythansi war leader has shown up with his 20,000 troops. Being outnumbered at least 4 to 1, the Weasel clan wouldn't stand a chance against the Tythansi in a straight battle. Instead, the difficult decision was made to allow the whirlwind troops to attack the refugees, and once they were engaged in slaughter, the weasel clan would outflank them, pinning the troops in. During this engagement, the spirits of the land arose to rip apart the Tythansi war leader. We don't actually have this part of the battle described, but I imagine the Tythansi lancers panicked upon being surrounded after their leader was killed, making them easy pickings for the Wiccan warriors. The result of the engagement, however, is the annihilation of the Tythansi troops, with at least several hundred refugees dead. Now, let's get back to the top of Geller Ridge. The marine wedge has flattened against the hard knot of heavy soldiers, and they start getting pushed back from the top of the ramp, as the jaws finally close around the 7th. Against the whirlwind's ferocity, the medium infantry held strong. When the jaws flinched away, the seventh bulged outward, cutting down enemies with their pikes, before streaking back into their square around the wounded. With the spear point being pushed back, the previously mentioned plan of the warlocks comes into play, with Nil and Nether stepping out in front of the foolish dog clan on either side of a horse, hands on both of its flanks. Three horn blasts sound out, signaling a split, and the marines break away from their skirmish, separating into the ditches on the ramp. The Garan heavies, sensing a trap, close ranks and backstep up to the top of the ramp. The reason for the split is so the Foolish Dog Clan can charge up the ramp into the heavy infantry. Under normal circumstances, this charge would be doomed to fail in two different ways. First, a charge up this steep of slope with a horse and soldier in heavy armor would tire out the horses and there's no way they would have the momentum to mount an effective charge. Secondly, cavalry is not meant to charge directly into cavalry that is set into ranks, even if you're using heavy cavalry. Nine times out of ten, 
a cavalry charge into set and ready infantry troops will fail. It is difficult getting horses to charge a solid wall of troops in the first place, and most likely the infantry could hold against the charge, especially if they're heavy infantry such as the, is the case here. Luckily for the 7th and the Foolish Dogs specifically, both of these problems have a solution today. First, Nil and Nether are using a ritual where they drain the life from a mare and transfer the life energy to allow the charging Foolish Dog horses to have extra energy and momentum. It's a huge sacrifice that takes a huge toll on both of the children, and the horse is literally boiled from the inside out. It's a very somber scene, especially when we see how greatly it affects the children and the other Wiccan warriors. Second, to save the charge itself are the engineers, led once again by the greatest tactician in the Empire, Captain Mincer. The engineers had left the camp the night previously, in order to go bury themselves in the ground up at the top of the ramp. So now we have the engineers popping out of the ground above the banks, and they take to the ramp between the Garan heavies and the charging foolish dogs. Charging the heavies, the sappers throw every last Moranth munition that they have before going to the ground with shields on their backs as the heavy cavalry overtakes them. The explosions ripped holes into the ordered ranks of the Garan heavies, allowing the foolish dogs to penetrate deep into the block of soldiers to unleash slaughter. The marines arrive to close ranks with the remnants of the front lines. All of this death quickly caused a full rout among Camus Relo's supposed elites, with Camus himself escaping through his warren. Down in the basin, the battle is still desperate with the 7th's infantry struggling against overwhelming numbers, but holding their ground around their wounded allies. The foolish dogs are recalled from their slaughter, and they wheel around and form back up to go charging down the ramp. Simultaneously, a mass of horses and cattle dogs charge across the river toward the northern force's flanks. The weasel clan, having finished off the Tythancy lancers to the east, are eager to join the fray. Cattle dogs leap into the air, pulling Tapasi and Seal cavalrymen from their horses as the Weasel Clan carves open their flanks. The confusion and fear from being attacked suddenly and from two sides causes the survivors to flee, freeing space for the Weasel Clan to reform and wheel around to now close with the Ubari infantry. The Foolish Dogs slam into the southern force, melting through the exposed archers to the west. The sudden turning of the tide of battle broke both groups of the whirlwind army, causing them to flinch away and flee. And with that, the battle is essentially over. Everything remaining is a full rout, with the mounted Malazan forces riding down as many enemies as they could. The number of deaths are overwhelming, tens of thousands of lives are ended within a few bells' time. Obviously, it was either the Malazans or the whirlwind, but it's just a reminder of the horrors of war. The Great Lie, Dolce et Decorum Est, Pro Patria Mori. Once the route is finished, there unfortunately isn't much time to rest. Sure, they thoroughly defeated Camus Relo and his army, but there is yet another army coming down from the north. This one is led by a cunning military commander and a traitor to the Malazan Empire named Corbolo Dom. Coltane wants to cross Vathar River two days ahead of Corbolo to prevent another contested crossing and to make it through the Vathar Forest, where there will undoubtedly be many ambushes. In order to accomplish this, there is no time for rest, and the chain of dogs must keep pressing forward. This is the end of the discussion for Geller Ridge. However, you may be asking yourself a few questions at this point. How could Coltane defeat an army three times his own size? Is this possible? Does this happen very often? What, are, there, are there any examples in history where maybe this kind of comes into play? And for that, I actually do have a few sources that we can look at. Oftentimes in medieval battles, a route is actually the location where most deaths occur. And if there's no route on either side, a battle tends to not actually have that many deaths. And sometimes, if you're able to capitalize on that route, then you can have an extremely one-sided battle where even just there's thousands of deaths on one side and only a couple hundred on yours. 
it can be insane. So let's take a look at a few battles that I have pulled up here. Just kind of some famous examples. I won't get it too far into them, but I'll post some videos, uh, some links to videos that may explain a little bit better. First up is the Battle of Marathon in 490 BC. You may have heard of this one. It's the reason why we have marathon runs. Modern scholars estimate the battle was between about 10,000 Athenians and about 26,000 Persians. These figures don't include the supposed tens of thousands of Persian sailors that may have participated on the Persian side. Maintaining a defensive position throughout the beginning of the battle, the Greek sides routed their opposition, allowing for the Persian center to be flanked. This caused a cascading retreat to the Persian ships, allowing the Greeks to commence a slaughter. All in all, there were only about 200 deaths on the Athens side, compared to about 4,000 to 5,000 on the Persians. Not very crazy, but it is really one-sided. The story goes that after the battle completes, an Athenian runner was sent back to Athens to inform the city. He sprints the entire distance from Marathon to Athens, shouts Nike, which means victory, then collapses and dies. So of course, humans have decided to celebrate this by running marathons for fun. This is all just a story though, and was probably made up to just add more drama around the battle. In 331 BC, Alexander the Great rode against the Persian army yet again, this time at the Battle of Gaugamela, also known as the Battle of Arbella. The Greek forces of about 47,000 were less than half of the Persian forces that are estimated to be about 100,000. After the opening movements, Alexander led a decisive attack flanking the Persian center and forcing Darius off the field. The right flank, with great discipline, won their engagement, with the Greeks there inflicting heavy casualties on the fleeing cavalry. The Greek left was barely holding on until Alexander turned his companion cavalry to support them, causing the last of the Persian forces to rout. It was a beautifully executed strategy that led to a very one-sided battle. Losses among the Greeks numbered between 500 and 1,100, while the Persians lost between 40,000 and 47,000. Now I'll jump forward again to the Second Punic War between Rome and Carthage. If you recognize this war, then you're probably imagining Hannibal crossing the Alps with his elephants, which was amazing of course. In the two years following this feat, Hannibal ravaged the countryside of Italy and met Rome for three major battles. All three of these battles could be included in this list, but I'll only be talking about the last battle, which was the Battle of Cannae. Rome fielded its largest army ever created at this point against Hannibal in the hopes of decisively defeating him quickly. Instead, what followed is often used as an example of a perfect defeat of an enemy army. The Romans deployed in a deeper formation than usual, causing their battle line to be shorter, while Hannibal advanced his center first. This allowed his center to perform a false retreat, and the wings of his army formed a double envelopment, allowing Hannibal to encircle the Romans and massacre them. There was no escape at this point, and one historian claims that nearly 600 legionaries died every single minute. All in all, it remains one of the most lethal single days of fighting in history. Nearly 50,000 Romans were killed, with 20,000 captured, compared to the roughly 6,000 losses on Hannibal's side. The remainder of Romans escaped, most of whom had been guarding the camp. So yeah, the overwhelmingly one-sided battle at Geller Ridge is very reasonable, and goes to show how important momentum and the tide of battle are in the grand scheme of tactics. If you made it this far into the video, thank you very much for watching, and I hope you enjoyed it. I'm sorry about the low quality of pixels during some of the battle. Uh, I think I figured out a way to fix it for the next one, but please let me know if any parts were confusing or if you have any suggestions. I hope you all have a great day.